one of the uh, young lads from Orient now is going to come over on loan and you're going to share a house together. So, okay. They said he'll be at the hotel tonight. So knocking the door, open the door, and it was Jeff Brazier. Remember, you know Jeff? Jeff, yeah. who does TV work now. I think he was like, uh, they, they, they thought of him really highly when he was uh, in the, the academy. He played against Benfica's reserves, but absolutely annihilated. I think we got beat 9-1. Um, they had two Brazilian internationals playing because they liked Iron Maiden. They said, oh, we want to come and play. So there was a couple of internationals playing and, and stuff like that. And then we didn't know. They did let some supporters in, but it wasn't football supporters. It was more rock rock guys who, who liked the band. And I think there was probably between three and 4,000 in there. It looked empty in there, but three or 4,000, you know what I mean, in that big yeah. stadium. And then afterwards, we were told, oh, we, we've got a, a guest who wants to come down and, and introduce himself and turn around. And it was, it was Eusebio. My first touch in football, or it wasn't a touch, all, all got played out wide to Danny Murphy. He went down the left wing and I came across and I just smashed him. Well, hello there and welcome to Jake Murphy Media YouTube channel. This is Talking Life, episode five with Glenn Wilkie. Now, Glenn is a man of many talents. Um, he works within recruitment construction or construction recruitment, whatever way you want to phrase it. He's also a media man at Leighton Orient, technically now, and has been a footballer as well. So let's talk about probably the first thing and how I got to know who you was properly because obviously when you played at Orient, I was a very very small boy. Um, is the kind of punditry on late and Orient TV? A that must be an absolute godsend at the moment to be able to watch the goes. But how did that come about? And secondly, how are you enjoying it? Because I know there are quite a few people that don't particularly agree with some of the words that you say. No. Um. First and foremost, thanks for having me on, Jake. I appreciate it. Um. Yeah. No. The the Orient stuff for me at the moment is is brilliant um in a way I, that, that I'm, I'm in a privileged position that i can actually go and see live football and professional football with that which obviously with with lockdown coronavirus for the last sort of year supporters have, have not been allowed to to go into games um okay they, they got into one or two sort of october november i believe and then it all closed down again so on that respect, it has been a bit of a godsend. It, it gets me out of the house. It, it gives me a bit, bit of a focus away from work and away from the family, which is great. And I really appreciate them getting in touch, really. It, it came about because I I do a, a radio show called The Orient Hour on Phoenix 98 FM. And, and that came about with, over the last two, three seasons, I've been seen, I got seen by Dave Victor, the media does all the, the commentary for Orient uh, a game one day about two, three years ago. And he said to me, on the next game you're here, let me know and you can come up and do your radio and little bits. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I did that. And then Andy Gilson, who runs the Orient, Orient um, Hour on Phoenix 98 FM, I knew him from previous, saw him at Orient, and he, he asked me would I be interested in coming on the radio show. Did that a few times, and then then they sort of bullied me into being a presenter on there, sort of on a rotor, which is which is great. I'm a bit nervous. It sort of wasn't in my comfort zone, so I had to sort of get down and learn the ropes a bit. And as you know, you you do this all the time. It's uh, at first with with anything media, you you've got to ask the right questions or try and ask the right questions and, and get the most out of the interviews. But yeah, so I was doing that. And I've uh, been doing that on and off for a couple of seasons now with, with Dorian Hour. And then uh, Luke Lambourne, the, the media manager at Dorian, he got in touch and said to me that we're, we're doing this streaming for, for the games because supporters are not allowed in. Would you, would you come up and do it one game? So I was like, yeah, no worries. Went up, did that. I think the first game was, I can't remember now, back in October. They got really good feedback and uh, he, he sort of said, look, we've got good feedback. Would you like to do it a bit more? And I said, yeah, no problem. So we got involved in doing that and 
unfortunately for supporters, they, they can't get into the ground. And unfortunately for supporters, they, they get to see me on TV, <laughs> uh, on their TVs. But yeah, 90% of, of, the, of the supporters have been brilliant. They've been fantastic and really supportive and, and great. You know, within anything there is out there, if someone don't, someone might not, not like the sound of my voice, the way I looked, I've had grief. Oh, who is he? He didn't play that much for him. Why is he on their TV? Get Terry Howard in or get this one in, get that one in, which I fully understand. I fully understand that. But obviously, the, the club and the media department have, have seen something they, they liked in me and, and have asked me to come along and continue to come along, really, and I absolutely love it. Well, I think that is the thing. You could say, for example... I don't know, when Orion played South End, the Orion was going to win 2 0. Joby McEnough was going to hit a free kick and score the free kick. But there would have still been somebody that said, but you actually said there was going to be five corners. There was only three. That's just comes uh, well, as well. Uh, the thing is, I always get asked predictions on there, and I've been silly enough to predict twice. And both times we've got beaten. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stay away from the predictions. And what do you know? Well, if I knew the predictions of football scores, I'd be a millionaire, wouldn't I? I'd be down yeah. William Hills every day, betting on every single football match, and I, I wouldn't have to be in this position sort of thing. So, yeah, no, on, on the prediction front, it's not gone too well, but it's just people have an agenda. People, you look at the manager, they go on a, on a winning run four games and they still want him out, certain supporters. So if he's getting that kind of sort of talk in the social media world, what chance have I got? Well, I would ask you your prediction of Orion Bolton tomorrow, but like you said, judging on the football, it's not. But, um, I guess the question from a media point of view, before we talk about what you're actually known for and your bread and butter is, you obviously know Leighton Orion, you know football, you know tactics, this, that and the other. But is there, was there, or is there still some element of nerves when that camera gets rolling that you think, damn, I'm actually live and every word I say is going to be scrutinised. And if I mess something up, then I've messed it up. Because if I mess something up now, I can cut it out. Yeah. But when you're live, you can't, you don't have that option to, is there some no. kind of nerves? And is that nerves the same as it is when you was on the pitch? No, totally not. Totally not. I think that when, the, when we go live, I sort of zoom out of that and forget we're live and just having a chat with with uh, the boys, the boys on the show alongside me, but um, and, that, and that's probably the worst thing actually. I've probably relaxed too much and talking to them like a couple of mates down the pub, you know, talking about football, which I need to reel that back in because I think I upset a few supporters on Saturday with one of the comments I, or two of the comments I made, which taken the wrong way, um, and I've got, I've got a few pelters on social media about that afterwards. Um, I was being too honest. I was just saying what could be said in the change room at half time, being around football most of my life. And it probably wasn't the, the comments I probably should have said on live TV with, child, with children watching. You know, I completely forgot where I was. So that won't ever happen again. And we'll just stick to being very professional and almost a bit boring. Although I had a few supporters get in touch and said, I like it the way you say it. That's, that's what happens in change rooms. You, that's the what professional footballers talk about and do regarding tactics and opposition and stuff. And, and that's not what they've been privy to. So they like that insight. But then obviously, like we said, there's going to be people who jump on the back and say, you shouldn't be saying this or you shouldn't be saying that. Yeah, I, I think obviously when you see, when you usually watch football on the telly, you are watching it through Sky or BT, which is literally to the button. You can't say this, you can't say that. But personally, I think it's great to actually kind of have your opinion because, okay, you're not going to go on there ranting, raving, losing your head, but you're also not afraid to mix your words. And I think it comes across like almost between the three setup, not bad, good cop, bad cop, but you say it how it is. And I don't actually think, predictions to the side, you've actually said anything that's not true. Well, no one has actually come on, apart from my predictions and something a bit sort of shaky I said on, on Saturday about the opposition. Uh, nobody's come on and said that information you're giving out is rubbish. Right? No one said that because they yeah. can't they can't question that because I'm I'm saying what well, I've I learned football to trade 
from arguably one of the best coaches ar well around and everyone you speak to about his coaching ability praise him so much praise him so much as a man manager he wasn't he wasn't great and there's youtube documentaries about him i'm, I'm talking about john sit and yeah we all bring you dinner and all that but as a as a coach he was phenomenal and i and i was very lucky along with a few other young lads to he was our youth team coach at orion i know we're going to come on to it but the information he gave us and he taught us the game and he taught us a lot about the game that you know if you get taught by a phenomenal teacher and they're giving you the right information and the good information it sticks with you for life really whereas yeah. that, so, so going back to the information i give on late and orion I, I i truly believe that the information i'm giving is correct apart from the predictions which is as anyone you know anyone can get it right or wrong right so um glenn's going to predict a five nil defeat to orion so we're getting wrong to right but let's move back to late and orion um well, obviously, you progress through the Leighton Orient Academy, and if, if the research is correct, apologies if it's wrong, you made your debut in the club for 1995, which was the year I was born. I'm not too sure if it was before or after I was born exactly. At the age of just 17, and it was um, against Crew Away, marking a very young Danny Murphy. Now, I'm assuming that's the Danny Murphy that played for Liverpool and Tottenham and stuff like that. So yeah. let's talk about your debut, Crew Away, probably not one of the nicest stadiums to go to probably wet windy and rainy if it's anything it wasn't actually it was snowing <laughs> was it snowing? <laughs> it was, I read, yeah obviously i remember that it was new year's eve it was okay. new year's eve um it was snowing we were obviously struggling in the league and then so it was, would have been the equivalent of league one today we were struggling i've I'd, I'd been in around the first team all season um, sort of on the bench, never got on. Uh, they, they tried to blood me in, taking me to away games, being around the team for, for when that kind of did come about. And, and from what I remember, we were we were getting beat 3 0. And Crew, it was a year after, I think Crew went up or they were in the playoffs, something like that. So they had Neil Lennon, I think Robbie Savage, Danny Murphy, um, I forget that. The, the guy they had up front who went on, he went on and had uh, played in the Premier League. Um, they, they had an unbelievable side, and and they were up there, and they just they were a real footballing side, and they they played us off the park. And I think it was three 0 at half time, and I was told warm up, and I was warming up and warming up. I think I warmed up for about seventy minutes. It was almost like I played a game, and then I think I got I don't know if I got twenty minutes or half hour at the end, and I got the call like you're going on. And I went on and I remember, and, and this is absolutely bizarre. I was standing there on the sideline. And as I literally went on, I went on for Terry Howard, a right back or right wing back, I think we were playing. And as I went on, I could start to feel myself cramping up in the legs. I've not played a minute. And it's the adrenaline, you know, the adrenaline of coming on, making your debut. Okay, you're losing 3 0. You just don't want to do anything wrong. You don't want to, you're passing, you want it to get to your teammate. It's one of them things, and I was the biggest person. I put the most pressure on myself because I wanted to perform. Okay, I knew if I did perform, then the team would be happy. But my first touch in football, or it wasn't a touch, all, all got played out wide to Danny Murphy. He went down the left wing, and I came across, and I just smashed him. And I missed time the tackle, but it was adrenaline. And I think I put him into the, to the advertising audience on the side. And the referee come steaming over, and I thought, I'm going to get sent off here. And our captain at the time, Glenn Cockrell, experienced pro, sort of went over to the ref, had a word with him and said, look, his debut has just come on, go easy on him. And I got away with it, I didn't even get a yellow card. And then once that happened and I got a few passes, I, I sort of calmed down and thought, this is football. Walked off the pitch, we, we lost 3-0. So I steadied the ship. <laughs> um, it, it, it was what it was. It, it wasn't a nice feeling losing. It was fantastic making making the first team debut at 17 years old. And you obviously you played for Orion for a little bit and then off camera you said, but obviously you had a leg injury and then you had to re-heal from that. And then the main talking point of this show is we can talk about your career in England, but what's interesting for me and what's going to be interesting for the viewers is you have played in Finland twice at kind of either end of your career. 
Um, first of all was with IFK Maryham and then with Hammerland IF. Um, with your stints in Finland, and obviously you've had spells at Chesen in between those. Now, for me, kind of, what was it like when you moved to Finland as a fairly young man? Was there any nerves? Was you scared? And how did that move to Finland come about initially? So, yeah, so at the last year of my career, last year of my career, last year of my contract at Orion, I'd, I'd um, a year left, uh, manager changed, Pat Holland came in. Ironically, he was the guy who got rid of me at Tottenham uh, a couple of years before. So as soon as he walks in the door, I'm thinking, oh, God, my days are numbered. I know he doesn't like me as a, as a player. Um, but I'd been around the first team sort of the previous season. So he came in, started pre-season, was in the reserves because we, we still had reserve team football then. Got a nasty injury away, away to Cambridge in a reserve game and snapped my ankle, basically. And I was out for six months. Um, I was out for six months. Got back to fitness. Was only meant to play 60 minutes in my first game back in the reserves. I think it was against Peterborough. And uh, it was a cup game. And they were saying, right, you've got to come off. I was like, right, no, I'm enjoying it. I've been out for so long, I want to carry on. Carried on, went to extra time. Snapped me other ankle in extra time on my first game back. And I was out then for the rest of the season. Um, so it was an easy decision for the club. Look, he, his excuse was, Pat Holland, look, I've not seen you play, which he had, because um, he knew me. Not seen you play, you're injured, we're going to have to let you go. No problem. Anyway, I had, I had the operation and it was basically that the, it was my ankle and it was my heel bone. They cut bone out and all sorts. I was out for a long period of time. I got fit towards the end of the year. Um, well, I was getting fit towards the end of the year. I had no club. I was keeping myself fit. I was playing games with uh, a rock band, Iron Maiden, who was based out in Essex. Uh, Steve Harris, he's, he lived in Harlow at the time. And he had a football pitch in his garden. And I thought, I don't want I just want to keep ticking over, you know. And there was a tall guy, an agent at the time, Michael Richard Cody, who was my best mate, Darren Percy's agent. And he had a chat with me, he said, look, you, you'll probably be fit in March time. And I said, yeah. He said, well, you can wait until the season starts in England in August for me to try and get you a club, or you can go abroad and play. He said, I've got contacts. I said, OK. He said, your options are you can go to Australia, Hong Kong, or Finland. And I was like, right, OK. So go and have a think about it. And I had a think about it. I thought Hong Kong's too far. I was 20, I think, at the, at the age. I thought Australia's too far. Never heard of their football. It's not like it is today. I know it's not, still not brilliant, but they've got a proper league there. Um, Hong Kong, I had a mate who, was, who had gone from South End to Hong Kong. So I gave him a ring and I said, what's it like? I said, I've got an opportunity to come over playing. He said, it's, it's fantastic. He said, it is the best thing you'll ever do in your life. And I was like, really? Is the football that good? He went, no, not the football. He said, the nightlife. He said, we're out every night drinking on it. He said, it's chaos. You're out five, six nights a week. And I just thought, I've been out for so long, football. I don't want to get involved in that. I just want to concentrate and start playing again because that's all I knew. So I was like, right, OK. And then I thought, look, Finland's only two, three hours away on a plane. I was a single lad at the time. Uh, beautiful women over there. So I was thinking that was in the back of my mind. And the football was... <laughs> was pretty good as well so it was an easy choice in, in that respect so I was told I'm going over to Finland didn't know where I was going I was in a I remember down in the hotel at Heathrow the night before and I got a call from the agent and he said look one of the uh, young lads from Orient now is going to come over on loan and you're going to share a house together but like, okay they said he'll be at the hotel tonight so knock on the door open the door and it was Jeff Brazier remember you know Jeff Jeff yeah. who does he work now. I think he was like uh, they, they they thought of him really highly when he was uh, in the, the academy or as an apprentice, as they used to call it. So he he came. We he was only a young lad. He was seventeen. So we both went over there, flew over to Helsinki. Didn't know we had to get a connecting flight. Ended up on this island. Didn't know anywhere where we were going. And the funny story was right. So we, so we get off the plane, walk off this little plane, one with propellers and all that. So it was a nervous flight in. 
walked down the steps and they go, oh, Jeff, nice to meet you. Da, da, da. And they looked at me and they went, Glenn? And I said, uh, yeah. And it was a bit weird. They were sort of looking at me up and down and I thought, this ain't starting well, what's going on here? I didn't realise. I got talking to one of the board members a couple of days later and I said, I've got a bit of a frosty reception there. What was that about? He said, well, we, we got a photo sent over to us. It's no like when you have your team photos at Orient, like your individual ones and your, your team. Yeah. Back then, I had a number one haircut like this, and it was a summer, right? So I tan really easily. So I had a right tan. They got sent a black and white photo. They thought I was a black guy. Oh, right? okay. When I'd gone over, I'd grown my hair. I was all pasty and white. They looked at me getting off the plane thinking, this ain't the guy we've, we've just uh, got. They, they, they didn't believe it was me. So I, ca I came off the plane. I was like, oh, right, OK. He said, so that's why they was a bit frosty. They, they didn't know that was you. They seen a picture and they thought it was somebody totally different. So yeah, got over there, got introduced. Um, it was a, a real culture shock, to be fair, to start with. Real culture shock. So you're over there. You're rooming with Jeff Brazier. What's the football like? What's the training sessions like over there? Like the intensity, obviously, it was some time ago now. And I guess like different things in like the diet, the food, because in your time where in England, is it correct in saying the kind of Tuesday nightclub for footballers was still a thing? You drink on a Tuesday, you drink heavily on a Sunday. Did that kind of follow over into Finland or was it, was it like a different style over there in terms of on the pitch and off the pitch? Yeah, well, on on the first the first day we went straight from the airport and the, and the team were training. They trained in the evenings, and uh, we got introduced to the players. and And on the board of directors at the club, there was a Scottish guy there, so he was sort of like the interpreter a bit, and he was introducing the players. And this is the one we're looking forward to. And there was this guy came over, and they said, oh, "This is a guy called Sebastian." He said, um, "Just the word, stay away from him." And I was like, "Why is that?" He said. He loves a drink and he's a bit of a womanizer. I was like, oh, right, okay. He ended up being my best mate for six months. <laughs> but um, no, so the culture, I thought, get away from England, all the drinking culture and that. Got over there. It was an older team, so a lot of them had family. So they didn't really go out and, and socialize. They got together after a game. It was on a Saturday. They, like most teams, have a few beers afterwards. But obviously, the younger, Younger people in the team would, would go out and enjoy themselves, but there was no midweek drinking over there, none of that, apart from this guy, Sebastian, who, who I uh, made friends with. But with regards to the football, the football was, it was a real eye-opener, sort yeah. of from what, we, what we'd what we been used to in, in England. We'd gone over there, and it was so technical. Back then, we were talking 20-odd years ago now, it was so technical. All the players could play. They, they had skills, they... That they were really, really technical, and I thought this, this is good. But only when we got into a game situation like pre-season friendlies and that, I realised they didn't really have much football intelligence. Yeah. So, uh, to understand how to how to sort of what to do in games, and that. they knew their positions. But they didn't know when they didn't have the ball where to be, how to cover. It it was a real and and it drove me mad. Absolutely drove me mad. Um, we. For the, for the season, I think the first half of the season, we didn't win a game. It was bottom of the league. And they changed the manager. They changed the manager and got this guy in who was, could only, he was a bit like Arsene Wenger, you know, he came in, he was a bit of a professor type. Yeah. And uh, he came in and he changed so much. He was really tactical, which was fantastic for me and, and some of the other players. And uh, a lot of the older guys didn't like that and sort of tried to revolt against it. But the second half of the season, we went unbeaten. So you work that one out, you know. But the football, the football was, it was good. It was good. Um, I got told off in one of the first training sessions. I was playing centre half and I've like, just driven, pinged this ball into the centre forward about 50 yards, waist high. It was one of the best passes I've ever done in my career. Literally straight to him. And the ref, um, the coach, the first coach, he blew the whistle. Stop, 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 stop. Stop the training session. Walked over to me. He said, uh, Glenn, no. I was like, what? He said, we don't do that here. I said, what do you mean we don't do that here? Yeah. He said, you, you don't pass to the forward. I said, why? It was a good pass. He said, I know. 
But that's why we have a midfield. You give the ball to them and you let them pass it forward. So I was like, right, okay. So it was one of them. You got the ball, you just give it to the midfielder, go and go do it. So it was pretty boring, to be fair, if you played at the back. Just got the ball, give it to the midfielder, let them go and do it. So it was just a, it was just a real culture shock, but it was it was probably one of the best well, one of the best things I've ever done in my life going out there, just from a, a life experience. And we go, we're going to talk about a specific photo, which is actually part of the uh, graphic that I've used. And I'm just going to try and work out how to share it on the screen so you can see what we're talking about. And um, really, kind of, what's your memories from this photo? And you me worried now because I don't know what's coming up. Yeah, you don't know what's coming up, but it's when the advertisement is take is you taken from this picture. It's on your Twitter, so there's nothing bad. Let's just try and work out how to share this. Um, oh, I can't minimise it while I'm recording, so right, I can't share the screen. So for the viewers that are watching this, this will be overlaid. But for yourself, Glenn, um, you may be able to see it just about on the camera if you can. Oh, right, OK, yeah, with you, Sabio. Is so, that yeah, one? talk, talk you about your yeah, one. Talk about your memories from that photo. Well, that that was what I said not long ago. I left Orient, um, was injured for the rest of that year sort of thing, just slowly getting back to fitness. And I knew going to Finland was sort of three, four months away. So I didn't want to get injured. I didn't want to play at a high level and risk risk blowing that contract, you know, and that experience. So one of, one of my mates or one of my neighbours, um, her boyfriend, is a friend of Steve Harris out of the Iron Maiden band. And he had, he had this football team with his mates. I used to play when he was in the country every other Saturday, you know. Um, they played in the league, but in the Vets League, I think. But they also played at his house, like we said. He had a football pitch in his garden with Baggins, other celebrity teams, Rod Stewart, go down to Rod's house and play. And they knew, well, this guy knew I'd, I'd just left Orin. He said, do you want to play one day? It's only, it's only a kickabout. And I was like, well, it'll, it'll keep me ticking over. So, so I went down there, I thought, I'm going to play on the right wing, not my position, but I'm going to play there because I know no one's coming behind me and going to kick me. And I thought, just protecting the body and that. Anyway, played with them. It was a doddle for me. Uh, really enjoyed it. Great bunch of lads. Steve Harris, who, who was in the band, whose who's football team it was, he played centre forward. So me on the right wing, I think I set him up four or five times. He scored four or five goals. So he, he loved it. He loved me. And he was like, oh, do you want to come, do you want to come next week? Do you want to come next week? And I was like, yeah, no worries. So I kept getting invited back. And then it, it was a bit of a bombshell, really. He said, look, the band's going on tour in Europe. So we've got a, a new album coming out. And uh, we're, we're touring Europe. And what we're doing, we're on, we're on the tour bus, but we're going to have another tour bus behind with a football team on. And every city we play a gig in, we're going to play a game against one of the record labels. So I was like... Yeah, no worries. I think I was 19 or 18, 19 at the time. I was like, yeah, all right. So I thought I'd just get fit. So went out on two of them, played a game in Paris. You didn't know, you just looked at the, the schedule of gigs and you had a game in Paris, then down in Madrid, went sort of around Spain. And then we, we ended up in, in Lisbon. So what we'd do, we'd play a game, then in the evening go to the concert, watch the band, get on the bus, Sleep, sleep the booze off, and as we we're asleep, the the bus would travel in the night to the to the next city where you'd go. So we knew we was going to Lisbon. We woke up in the morning, stationary, opened the curtains on the bus, sort of bit of a weary edge. Looked out, and there was these lush training pitches. It was amazing. But, oh boys, we've got hang it today. The pitches look decent. And I went, yeah, they do look good. The sun was beating in the windows. One of the boys opened the curtains on the other side of the bus, looked out, and it was a stadium of light. He went, are we playing there or are we playing there? Yeah. So like, we know we're playing in there. So we went for breakfast and I had a, had a chat with Steve. He said, no, we're, we're, they've organised it. We're playing in the stadium of light. This stadium holds 80, 90, 100,000. I don't know. They, it's the old stadium of light. They knocked it down not long ago, well, not long after, and, and built a new one. So it was like, yeah, brilliant. And they said, he said, oh, we've got a couple of ex-pros, a couple of other ex-pros flying in to, to help out because we think we're playing against Benfica's reserves. I'm like, right, okay. 
So in that team, you've got a few electricians, a few plumbers, a few rock stars, me. Um, so I was like, right, okay. So Neil Webb, the ex-Man United England player, he flew in with Ian Bishop, the ex-West Ham Man City player. They've been drinking on the plane. So uh, they turned up a bit merry, but had, had a warm-up, had a chat, sort of about the game, played, played against Benfica's reserves, but absolutely annihilated. I think we got beaten 9-1. They had two Brazilian internationals playing because they liked Iron Maiden. They said, oh, we want to come and play. So there was a couple of internationals playing and, and stuff like that. And then we didn't know. They, they'd let some supporters in, but it wasn't football supporters. It was more rock, rock guys who, who liked the band. And I think there was probably between three and 4,000 in there. It looked empty in there, but three or 4,000, you know what I mean, in that big yeah. stadium. And then afterwards, we were told, oh, we, we've got a guest who wants to come down and, and introduce himself and turn around and it was, it was Eusebio. I was like, blimey, blimey. I didn't, obviously, it was a bit before my time and a lot before your time, but I remember my dad talking about him and, and seeing clips and goals and and he was just a legend, you know what I mean? Uh, especially for Ben Feig. When he come down, had a chat, so we, we had the photo and then we had a good night, good night in Lisbon afterwards. So... You've obviously had that story. You've joined. You've gone to Finland to Finland, should I say, to marry her? You come back, and obviously your involvement with Cheson. Now Cheson currently sit in the European Premier League, which is step three of non-league. What was Cheson back when you played, and what would you say the standard was of non-league football back then compared to it is now? Um, yeah. So so the season finished in sort of October time. Because uh, it ran from March, April to, to October because of the harsh winters over there. So I came back and they'd already offered me another deal for the following year. So I just had to keep, me, keep myself busy sort of four or five months. So the old Leighton Orient youth team manager, uh, Tom Loizu, who's the manager at Haringey Borough at the moment, he was at Chesham and he said to me, look, come and, come and play for us. It'll be easy for you. It'll keep you fit. You know what I mean? Just stay out of trouble and... and just, just play. And I think they was in Ryman Division 1. I, you know what? I don't even know. I'm trying to think. I, I know I think it was Ryman Division 1. Uh, Wingate and Finchley and teams like that were in there. And I think they were pretty strong at the time. Um, but he assembled a really good squad. He got a few ex-players um, who have been around a professional game through his contacts. Went down there and played. And do you know what? We just... It was a laugh. It was a lot. It wasn't serious. It was my first time of training Tuesday and Thursday night and playing on a Saturday. Um, it, it, it was tough. It was men's football. It was like football. It was it was thumping. You know what I mean? You didn't mess around. You didn't hold on to the ball too long because you'd end up getting hurt. So it, it was real tough. There were some very, very good teams in there. Look, like today, teams with money who, who get the better players and and, and do a bit, um, but I really thoroughly enjoyed my time there. Really enjoyed my time. As with regard to today's non-league, I must admit, I don't really get to see much non-league these days, obviously, what we're going, what, with what's going on. But the, the only non-league I've seen in the last few years is probably the National League, which used to be the conference, you know what I mean? Because my local team, Maiden Edge United, are in there. Obviously, the O's are in there. For a couple of seasons watching them, so I, I couldn't compare it to today's what what current level it would be today. Um, but speaking to people, speaking to Darren Purse after his career, he went and played to sort of Ryman Premier, and uh, I, I watched him a few times. And I'd say it's probably similar to sort of the Ryman Premier League, you know. It's but it was a bit more blood and guts rather than pretty football like it is today. And when you was playing for Chesson, obviously you was on your break your off-season kind of from Finland. So whereas most semi-pro footballers would be doing their nine to five, going training, kind of play football, I'm assuming that you was just playing for Chesson and kind of living off the money that you was earning in Finland, or did you have a job at the same time you was playing Chesson no. or Chesson? Well, I, what I did, I was, I, was, I was pretty sort of clued up at a young age and I was advised well and someone saw potential in me to be a coach. So I took my coaching badges when I was 16 or 17, took them really young. And I passed the equivalent of what is the today's UEFA B. 
at that sort of age. So that, uh, probably not a lot of people know that when I was 17 and I was in and around the first team at Orient, on a Tuesday and Thursday night, I used to go down and coach the Centre of Excellence over at Douglas Air in Wolverhamstone. So I would train in the mornings and, and play for Orion. I would then give up my time as part of my coaching to go and coach the 11, 12, 13-year-old kids um, alongside some of the other coaches. So people like Nicky Shorey I used to coach, um, who went on and had a great career. People like that. So I, I was coaching at a young age. So when when I, I had my coaching badges, when, when I was playing in that sort of interim period of being in, at, in and out of Finland, playing for Tresen, then in the daytime, I... I worked for a company or it was called Crown and Manor Boys Club. I don't know if it's still there now. They're in, they're in Islington, right on the canal. And they was probably one of the first in this country to have the academy system where kids would go to college in the morning and then in the afternoon they would train, train and play. So what they did, they had a tie-in with a Japanese company and they would send Japanese kids over, 10 of them, a year and they would go to a college in the mornings to learn English as well as some of the English card, uh, kids so there was 20 24 kids and in the afternoon we would coach them and the idea behind it was some of the boys had dropped out and got released by pro clubs who we picked up and some of the Japanese boys were decent actually and we would then go and play against um, academy academy type sides and if they wanted any of them they would just cherry pick the boys and, and try and further their career in the game. So it was probably one of the first in the country. The model was the first in the country. And I did that on and off for about three or four years in between going to Finland. So that I was doing that in the day, coaching, getting a bit of money from that, playing for Chesham, getting a bit of money for that. So that, that was tying me over. And then obviously some savings from, from being out in Finland. And obviously, I know we're both pressed for time, so we won't keep you too long, Glenn, but we've got to talk about this. And how I come to know that you obviously played in Finland was through watching uh, Billy Coe's and Root show with Darren Purse on the other week. So there's your plug, Billy. Hope you're happy. Um, Darren Purse obviously said that you brought him over to Hamerland. And no, IFK Mariam. IFK Murray, I'm sorry, so I've got that the wrong way. So you got him over there on towards the end of your career, sorry. And how did that move come about bringing Darren over there? And you kind of had more of a role in it than is people may have thought, haven't you? Um, Dar Darren obviously had played over 500 professional games or 600 professional games. He had a great career. And like I said, he's, he's my best mate, best mate before football, best mate in football and after. So when I was playing, I didn't get a chance to see him. So I, I used to, when I, when I stopped playing for injury after all the operations I had, about 25, I went and watched him, followed him around the country, went and watched him a lot. Towards the end of his career, he, he sort of 30 odd he, in the professional game. I think he, he got Paul Val promoted, but they didn't offer him uh, another contract. And he, he said to me at the end of the season, he said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, um, he, he said, I'm getting offers, but it's not what I want. I said, oh, right. I said, would you ever go back and out to Finland? And he said, yeah. He said, if, it, if, if the package is right, he said, I, I wouldn't mind going out there. I said, all right, OK. I kept in touch with one of the board members, a guy called Dan Nealand over there from when I played there. And he was still involved in the club, but not a director. And I, I always look out for their results. And I knew they was hovering about third position in the league. And they were going for the Europa League, like they needed to finish in the top three. And I think there was probably about 12 games left of their season. So I, I put a call in, had a chat with them, said, look, Darren's not doing anything. Are they looking for any players? I said, let me ask, let me ask the club. He spoke to them, says, yeah, they'll be interested. So come back to me, I said, look, they're interested. This is serious again for the Europa League. Have a chat with them, sort of thing. So sort of not bro well broken the deal, but he down. I then passed it over to Darren, sensible guy. He spoke to the club direct, um, obviously about the financials and the package and everything. And then he he couldn't sign until the the transfer window opened, which was I think it was August or late July. He then flew over there and and signed for him, and I think he got sent off three times in that last. <laughs> 
in, the, in that 12 games or something. So we've done a suspension, come back, got sent off and kept doing it about that. And I don't know if they made, made the uh, Europa League that season. I don't know. But um, I was sort of involved in that in, in, a, in a small way. You know, I just put them in touch with each other. And, and, and I was his unofficial agent. I didn't <laughs> really get paid for it. And obviously these days you work within, um, like I say, the construction recruitment industry. So I can imagine what a long day you've had and how tired you are. So maybe it's not the best time to ask this question, but we're going to ask you it anyway. What I want from yourself for the final question of Talking Life episode five is your five-a-side team with a manager that you can't name yourself in. The manager has to have managed you and the fibre side has to be with players you've either played with or against. Played with or against? Have I got to include a goalie? Yep. <laughs> oh, I've got to include a goalie, OK. Um, I would say goalkeeper would be Neville Southall. Um, I'll come on to that, how I played with him in a bit. I would have Peter Beardsley in the team. Um, I was forcing that fortunate enough to play with Peter Beardsley. I would then probably, I would throw Ian Bogey in there. He used to be at the O's. He was probably playing when you, you wasn't born, mate, but he was unbelievable. He was, he was rated better than Gaza when he was in Newcastle with him. And he, he was a phenomenal player. Same sort of player as Gaza, elbows up, centre midfielder, protect, protected himself, had all the skills, but for some reason, he, he never made it to the top level, but he, he was he was probably the one of the most skillful players I've ever ever had shared a pitch with. Um, so that's what was that three? That's three. Yeah. That's no, that's four. That is that three or four? Three. Uh, yeah, three. I would then go with. I'll throw Darren Purse in there, just just because he's my mate and uh, he had a he had a pretty decent career. And then up front, I would probably. Oh, this is a toughie. I'll tell you what I put in there. A guy from non-league football who was around a professional game. Enfield stitched him up with a, a move to Sheffield Wednesday when he was in non-league. They wanted too much money. They wanted a million quid or something stupid like that. Nicest guy, nicest guy, funny guy, wand of a left foot. Um, a guy called Robert Boyce. Uh, people were in and around non-league. I don't know if Covey might know of his name. He played. He played a bit of non-league. Then he sort of lost interest. He was, he was like, he was too good for it. He was like, I don't want to play this. Yeah. But Robert Boyce, he he was a fantastic player. So going back to Beardsley and going, um, Neville Southall, I was uh, I played a, a, a few charity games with them. So I'm I'm claiming them that I played. <laughs> Well, that's just some quite um, a five-a-side team there. Now, uh, thank you very much for your time today, Glenn. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. As always, thanks for everyone who's been watching um, my episodes, the last one with Ross Emberton. I know a few of you have watched the one with Dean Cox. Please tune in next week on Saturday um, for the Live for Libby. Obviously, we're going to be raising some money for Live for Libby um, to try and get her that bone marrow transplant to save her life. And it's been Talking Life, episode five with Glenn Wilkie. By the time you guys see this when it's out on Sunday, let's hope Leighton and Orion have got three points away at Bolton Wanderers. But until next time, guys, take care. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>